Greetings again today in that name that's above every name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We appreciate you that are visiting with us. May the good Lord bless you. Hope you come back again. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, I most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking, hoping during this hour we can be an inspiration to you. I most certainly appreciate you and the radio listening audience tuning in to get the Northside Baptist Church Hour. And if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, or chapter 6 rather. I read a verse in chapter 7. It's page 1234 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. Now, I want you in the radio listen audience to write to me and pray for me. We're having a difficult time to stay on there during these days. And seem like God's people in the radio listen audience forget this is a faith ministry. And the people of this world keep their programs on the air and on TV. And yet God's uh, men that's trying to get out the gospel through a medium of radio or TV has a tough time trying to get the job done. The devil is about to capture this country. God's people are sitting around doing nothing about it. And I want you to pray for this ministry. And you write to him and stand by this home mission work. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. Now while you're turning to 2 Corinthians chapters 6 and 7, I want to say just a word about something that disturbed me. I read in the paper Friday. It's pertaining to abortion. Now we know abortion is wrong, we know it's sinful. We know God will forgive that kind of sin like he would any other kind of sin, a murder or whatnot. But I'm greatly disturbed about uh, what's happened here on Broad Street. I read in the paper, I'll read the first paragraph of the clipping. It says a new billboard on Broad Street proclaiming that abortion is a woman's right. It's aimed at changing the public opinion, uh, opinion of abortion According to Cindy Short of the Feminist Women's Health Center of Athens, this is the second year the center has sponsored a pro-choice billboard, unquote. Now that billboard has been placed somewhere on Broad Street. And the city officials who have permitted that to be done, of course they did wrong in doing it, and the person who put it up there did wrong. It's a sinful and wicked act because it encourages abortion, and abortion is murder. And everyone that's responsible had a part in it would be guilty of having the blood of the innocent on their hands when they face God in the judgment. Now since that billboard has been put up, it ought to be taken down or either there should be another billboard placed there beside it, underneath it or above it, saying abortion is murder. Now someone ought to see that that is done. And if that is not done, then that billboard should be taken down from Broad Street where it's erected. It's wrong, it's sinful, it's wicked. And if you're guilty of having an abortion, God will forgive you if you mean business. If you'll ask God to forgive you and promise not to do it again, God will forgive you. It's a sin like any other sin, and sometimes it's a sin far worse than many other sins. Now I have something here. I clipped out of a paper. It's very touching. I want to pass it on while I'm on this subject. Now I want you to listen to this as I read it. And I clipped this out of a periodical that came out of a religious uh, periodical that comes to my uh, desk. And this is the cry of an unborn child. And I quote, Today I will be slaughtered. My parents have arranged for me to be murdered. They're paying a man to do this and he's called a doctor. In the underworld, men are hide to kill others. When they're convicted, they're punished by imprisonment or death. But the doctor who has been hired to kill me will never be tried. It is legal. It is called abortion. But I'm a human being and have a right to live. God intended that I should be born. They call me a fetus because I still live in my mother's womb. The word fetus means little one. I am a little human being and all my systems are working perfectly. My heart has been beating ever since conception. In this little room where I live, right under my mother's heart, I've been well taken care of, receiving all needed nutrition from my mother's body. 
I wanted to be born just as other children, but my parents didn't want me. My death sentence has been already been pronounced, and I must die today. If I could be born, I would bring much happiness to my parents and all the family. I have inherited the traits and characteristics of my parents, and we could have a lot of fun together. God's given me a beautiful little body, and I don't like the idea of being chopped to pieces and thrown into the sewer, but I'm helpless. If I could only be born and grow up, perhaps I could defend myself, but they're going to slaughter me today. I know I'll be missed a lot by, be missed a lot, missing a lot by not being born. I have two beautiful eyes, but will never see the light of day. I can never look into the face of my loved ones. Never can I see this big, wonderful world that God has created. I have two ears, but will never hear the sound of music, laughter, and conversation. My little nose will never smell the scent of flowers. I have the sense of taste, but can never enjoy delicious foods that human beings eat. I have a perfectly formed voice box, but will never be able to speak or sing or laugh. I'm fearful and wonderfully made, but today my body will be whittled to pieces. They don't want me. I wonder why. But the God who formed me loves me and he received my soul into heaven and perhaps someday will give me a new body. I'll be murdered today. May God have mercy on those who are responsible for killing me. I'm a fetus, a little one, a little human being. I have a divine right to live. Wish I could talk to my mom and daddy about this. But now the doctor's bringing the butcher knives. Goodbye forever. End quote. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, chapter 7, verse 1. Verses 17 and 18, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now look at chapter 7 and verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting wholeness in the fear of God. I'm going to speak to you today on this line of thought, the sin or the sins of the spirit. I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit, but the spirit of man. The Bible said man has a body, soul, and spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23. Now the body is the part you see. The soul is our self-conscious nature. The spirit nature of man makes him God-conscious. So man is a trinity, has a body, soul, and spirit. And the Bible plainly tells us so. But I want to speak about the sins of the spirit. Many times we talk about the sins of the body, but we may say nothing about the sins of the spirit. That is, sins of the spirit. Now I want to mention them today. Number one, the sin of pride. Now, the sin of pride is the sin of the spirit. The word pride is synonymous with the word boasting or bragging. Now, that is a sin of the spirit. Boasting and bragging, of course, is synonymous with pride. They all go together. In Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now we see here, according to the Bible, that pride has to do with boasting and bragging. You know, the man that killed the little boy Adam. Many of you saw that on TV, the story of little Adam. And after that was shown, this man owned up to the one that killed him. He was in prison for another cause, already committed other murders, and served in time. And he just confessed that he killed the child and cut his little head off and and he told him where he buried the body. He's gone with him to show him where that he buried that body. And uh, he said he'd killed at least 50 people. He's bragging about that. His buddy that he ran with for a while said he had killed 165 human beings across America. And he's laughing and bragging about that. And a judicial system today. And that's why many people are going to have to suffer and innocent people die. They found the body of that 16-year-old girl that that man kidnapped. They found the body. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. 
Now that man will go and kill other young girls. He may eventually get caught. But the terrible tragedy is when they catch him, if they ever do, they won't do anything about it. Put him in prison, take good care of him, feed him, clothe him, let you pay for his bill and do nothing about it. That's the rotten condition of our system in the land today. And that's why many innocent people are dying. And these liberals and these ACLU uh, uh, pro-crime organizations responsible for a lot of that, they for killing unborn babies, but they want to spare the criminal. They got the thing in reverse. Beloved, it's bad. Now, these men bragged about these murders, boasted about them. One said, I've killed 165. The other said, I've killed at least 50. And they're bragging about it. In Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 23, a man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. We find in the Bible there was a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel chapter 4 and verse 37, the Bible said, And those that walk in pride is able to abase. And Nebuchadnezzar built great Babylon, one of the greatest wonders of the world. And he bragged about it. He said, See what I've done. He built a great image for people to bow down and worship. He said, See what I have done. And then God said, I'll humble you. And God humbled Nebuchadnezzar, drove him out like an ox, eat grass like an ox until his hair growed out like eagle feathers and his fingernails growed out like bird claws. But when God finished humbling that man, he had to admit there was a God in heaven and his pride was very wicked. And we know the sin of the spirit is pride. That's one of them. Now you remember years ago, the proud SS troops of the German army. If you've seen them on the news, on a screen, you've seen them goose stepping. Very proud army. They said, we are the super race. We go and destroy, we capture the world. We're the super race. But where are they today? Pride brought Hitler down and his SS troops brought them down. And you know what happened to them. Pride goes before fall. And when we get so proud and so arrogant that we think that nobody can bring us down, remember there's a God in heaven. He knows how to do it. That was a nut one time that was sharpening a long bladed knife. When asked what he was going to do with it, he replied, I'm going to cut off Ben Brown's head and turn it around so he can see where he came from. Now he had that in his mind. If he could cut the man's head off and turn it around, then the man could see where he came from. I remember back years ago when Governor Madison's governor of Georgia doing one of the Peach Bowl games, he rode his bicycle backward. One of the editors wrote in the newspaper and said, Old Lester, he likes to see where he's been more than he likes to see where he's going. And a lot of times people have that in mind. They're more proud of what they've done and where they came from than they are about what they're trying to do out here to help humanity and do things for God. The Bible said we need to look at the pit from which we would dig. Every last one of us came out of the mud. We came out of the dirt dirty. We came out of the pit. We have nothing to brag about there. We can only brag about the grace of God that lifted us out of the miry clay of sin. And then number two, there's a sin of conceit. In Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 12, Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There's more hope of a fool than of him. You have some people today that's greatly conceited, and the Bible said they're foolish. People can be greatly hurt through compliments. Somebody can go in and pass compliments on people and brag on them and make a fool out of them. And they become conceited. And when they do, God said they're very foolish. The sorrows of the youngest can be hurt through conceit when it's come from a compliments passed on by others. And we know that's a wicked sin of the spirit. J. Frank Norris said, Preachers are like wasp. They're bigger when he's first hatched than any other time. You have a lot of young preachers today. They start out in the ministry and they allow pride to get into their hearts and it runs their ministry. A lot of talented people and they start out trying to serve God. They have good ability and good talent, but they allow pride to come in and it destroys their service for God. You've heard me tell the story about the young preacher came to the pulpit. Oh, he was someone. He wanted to strut up and show the people how it's done. He got up there going to preach a great sermon. He was just fresh out of the seminary. The old retired, the old preacher there, the pastor there for years, never had the privilege to attend the seminary. Probably a good thing he did not. 
And this young squirt was going to show them how to do it around there and how to preach and tell them something. And he walked up in the pulpit and threw out his chest and ran back and God just let him make a flop. He couldn't preach. He stammered. He stammered. And he was humiliated. He was embarrassed. And when he finally saw he couldn't bring the message, he walked down out of the pulpit. And a dear lady sitting down there, a wise old lady said, you know, if that young man had gone in the pulpit like he come out, he could have come out like he went in. And if you're gifted, then humble your heart before God and praise God for it. Don't let him make a fool out of you. And then there's a sin of selfishness. The Bible defines selfishness as a pleasing of oneself. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 7, For a bishop must be blameless as, as a student of God, not self-willed. Now people become too selfish, too self-willed, and that is a sin of the Spirit. And that selfishness. I clipped out a little clipping out of the, uh, the daily bread. It told about how that yonder in, uh, in Japan says an unusual place of worship called the Temple of a Thousand Buddhists. On display, it says there that inside the shrine are more than a thousand likeness of Buddha. Each just a little different from the other. They're there so the devotees can come in, find one that looks like most of them, or himself, and worship it. How sad, yet how much like people the world over. The God of self, selfishness. They want to go into this place and there find a, a Buddhist, a God, that, that somewhat looked like them, and then bow down and worship that thing. And they did that through selfishness. Now selfishness will rob you of your service for God. When you come to the end of the day, how much time have you given in love for yourself? All day long you've been doing something. How much have you given to yourself? How much have you given to God? Selfishness will keep a Christian from tithing. If a man is not selfish, if a Christian is not selfish, he'll tithe his income. But if he's selfish, he, he won't do it. He'll rob God and keep God's part. Selfishness does that. Greediness. The Bible said, he that hastens to be rich is not honest. And so we need to realize that. Self to keep a person away from going to church. You say, well, it's too, I'm too tired. Raining a little too much today. It's a little too damp on the outside. The weather's not exactly right. I don't think I'll try to make it today. Why? Selfishness. Selfness is a sin. When we're far more concerned about self than we are about God and the things of God, it's a sinful thing. As church members right now listen to the sound of my voice, the radio listen audience, you know as well as I know you ought to be in God's house today and you put up a little excuse because of the weather. You know why? You're selfish. Whether you like it or not, you're selfish. You're more concerned about yourself than you are about the things of God. You might as well admit it. You know I'm telling you the truth. And then number four is a sin of ingratitude. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2, for men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient, perhaps unthankful, unholy. The sin of ingratitude. We are not thankful. We don't appreciate what God's done for us. We don't appreciate a good Bible-believing church. We don't appreciate a country like America like we should. The Bible tells us so. The Bible says the end time would be like the unthankful, unholy. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 14 and 15, the Bible said there was a little city and a few men within it. There came a great king against it and besieged it and built a bulwark against it. Now that was found in it a poor wise man. And he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no man remembered that poor wise man. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verses 14 and 15. One little insignificant man spared the city from being captured. And of course when they realized they were spared... They forgot about the little fella. They didn't know who he was. They didn't care anything about who he was. They, they just plainly forgot about him. And we have that sin in the land today. There's people that you have helped and done things for. They soon forgot it. Sometimes children, their parents go to the limit and sacrifice to help them and do things for them. And how quick they forget it. They forget it when they get up maybe of age and kind of get out on their own. They soon forget what mother and dad did for them. While they were growing up. It hurts deeply. When I was in school young at Bob Jones University many years ago. There's a young boy there from Athens. I knew him before he ever attended the school. And he was coming down the street one day. And I saw his hair down his back. And he knew, needed a haircut. That was in the days whenever men were men. And 
believe in getting a haircut once in a while. And so I gave him money to get a haircut. And he went and got him a haircut. He didn't have the money to get a haircut. The boy went ahead and I think finished school there probably. And then later on, when I came back to Athens and when I organized the Northside Baptist Church here, this same fellow had a church in adjacent county. And when he found out I organized the Northside Baptist Church is going to be independent, he called his deacons together and he, he said, now we're not going to grant Brother Edwards Northside Baptist Church church letters. We just won't grant a letter to an independent Baptist church. And he was the first man that refused to grant a letter to the Northside Baptist Church because we were straight in the scriptures and believed in uh, moving according to the Bible. And he got his church to refuse to grant us a letter. Well, I didn't care anything about the letter anyway for us. It was the principle of it. I helped that man when he couldn't even get a haircut. Now, beloved, listen to me. Where's that man today? That man hasn't preached in years. Soon after that, he quit preaching. And he hasn't preached in years. As far as I know, he hasn't passed the church. Now, you can't get too big for your britches. And then people try to accommodate you and help you. And you completely ignore them and stab them back and do them dirty and get by with it. Remember, there's a God in heaven. Many of a person I've tried to help. I have own children in the Lord. I've won to Jesus Christ. They're saved. They're born again. They'll go to heaven when they die. I won them to God. I fed them the milk of God's word. I helped them along the way. And then they've gotten mad about something for no cause at all and run out maybe and leave the church and go somewhere else and fight against this preacher and fight against this church. It breaks your heart. But you must remember, there's a God in heaven. A preacher that I've done more for than any other preacher's ever done for him. Got him his church, got him a couple of churches, helped him, done tremendous things for him, encouraged him, wanted to fellowship with him, turned around and stabbed me in the back and hurt me deeper than any preacher that's ever tried to stab me in the back. Hurt me so deeply I'll never be able to get over it. That's as much as I'm going to say about it. And I did more for him than any living preacher. Sometimes when you help people, they soon forget about it. They don't care anymore. Get old, they say, turn him out to pasture. Give us a young man to be our pastor. We don't care. He's preached here 20, 30, 40 years. Turn him to pastor. Let him get along the best way he can. Maybe he can make his own social security. If not, let him starve. Don't care anymore about the old man that stood there year in and year out and buried their dead and married their young and coughed them while they were uh, grieved and visited them while they were sick. That's a weak and terrible sin. Any church to do a thing like that. I want to tell you something about a man by the name of Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill, you know, is a man that saved the world just about it in World War II. Great a man, a giant of a man. I want to give you something from a clipping I have here that I think that you're interested in. And Winston Church here was getting ready to meet uh, Parliament and, and encourage him pertaining to um, remaining steadfast because the war. The Germans had just about bummed them into the ocean, had set their buildings on fire, had destroyed hundreds of their buildings, killed a lot of their people. And it looked like England was going down in spite of all they could do. Old Winston Churchill had to go before Parliament and see what he could do about it. And I'm going to read you something here and I quote now. He was writing the speech that he would deliver to Parliament. It is said that his secretary knew to sit at least 20 feet away. He would pace the floor thinking, thinking as he walked and dictating out loud. All of a sudden when he had said, we will fight them in the streets. We'll fight them in the landing fields. We'll fight them on the beaches. We'll fight them on the high seas. And he said, if I pray God, it will never come to pass. If our island be subjected, our kingdom beyond the seas will carry on the war. All of a sudden he stopped. The secretary looked and wondered what was wrong. Old Winston Church here was weeping and trembling with emotion. Then out of his courageous mouth, there came these words, we shall never surrender. The next day he went to Parliament. There they sat defeated. Heads on their chests. England had, had been almost bombed in the sea. In 10 minutes, Winston Churchill electrified them and the world. And he said that he was a dictator of England. He had the nation in his hands. He saved it from disaster. But now watch. The war ended and literally thousands of people acclaimed him as England's benefactor. In 11 weeks, mark it, in 11 weeks, the election came. 
The election came in and less than three months, they had voted Winston Churchill in defeat. They couldn't even elect him to a seat in parliament, unquote. That was a man that almost saved the world during the days of Hitler's attack. And three months after the war, they voted him out and he couldn't even get a seat in parliament. That's how England appreciated that giant Winston Churchill. We are living in a day when people don't appreciate anymore what good things have done by many people. That's a sin. That is a sin of the spirit. Unappreciation. Don't appreciate what's done for you. What others do for you. What your parents sacrificed to do for you. Don't appreciate it. Don't appreciate maybe your church many times and or maybe even your pastor or the deacon, the teachers. Unappreciated. That is a wicked sin. You ought to be appreciative. You ought to be a person to appreciate things that's done to help you and encourage you. Never forget them. The man that helped win me to Jesus Christ along with my mother could walk up and spit in my face. I'd still love him. I'd put my arms around him. And I'd say, Brother Lester, God bless you. You're one of the most humble men I've ever known. I love you. I appreciate you helping my mother win me to God. That man could never turn me against him. He helped keep me out of hell. He and my mother by winning me to Jesus Christ. You should never forget people that's helped you along the way and done things for you. Then number five, there's a sin of discord. In Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 19, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. You know what a discord is in the musical field. You have somebody in a quartet trying to sing, and they get off key and throw a discord in there and throw everybody off. You've seen people like that. You've had the old brother Ivy's in the choir that would get up and, and uh, get uh, louder than somebody else or lower than someone or off key and throw the whole choir off. You know what that is. That's discord in the choir and discord among the musical world. But I'm using that as an illustration. You can sow discord among the people in the church and turn them against their church or against members in their church or even against their pastor or against the teachers or friends in the church. And so in discord is a very serious and dangerous thing. The Bible said a false witness that speaketh lies and sows discord among the brethren. God said, I hate that. You should never be guilty of sowing discord among God's people. God wants the church to be in one accord and be in harmony as we serve the Lord. A person so with discord is a sinful person doing wicked things they will answer God for. Then we come to the next one. Number six is sin of criticism. Now I won't have time to deal with that at length, but there's a grave danger of being too critical about things and, and the old sin of criticism. Some people, all they harp on is something negative, negative, uh, condemning this, condemning that, harp on this, harp on that, critical about everything. That's a trap the devil will get you caught in and ruin you if you're not careful. It's all right to offer uh, constructive criticism, nothing wrong in that. But if you get caught in the trap of being negative and critical about everything that happens and everything that comes along, you're caught in the devil's steel trap of criticism and that is a sin that's a sin of the spirit you need to watch yourself and don't get caught in a, a negative state and always critical and always negative and always down on everything that's exactly what the devil wants you to do and you're trapped you'll never be able to accomplish much for God in your life as a Christian if you get caught in a situation like that that's a woman walked up to a preacher one time said preacher I have a gift he said what is it sister he said my gift is um, destructive criticism well, whoever heard of that? Now, that, she didn't get that gift from God. She may have a gift of destructive criticism, but don't accuse God of giving it. That comes from the devil. Now, good constructive criticism is helpful. Destructive criticism is harmful, and we need to realize that. Then number seven, there's a sin of influence. In Romans chapter 14, verse 13, let no man put a stumbling block in his brother's way. That's influence. Romans chapter 14, verse 7, none of us live it to himself and no man dies to himself. That's influence, the spirit of influence. We're influencing somebody along the way. Every step we take and where we go, we don't live to ourselves, we don't die to ourselves. We have influence over others. I wonder if it's good or is it for bad. If it's for good, great will be your reward. If it's for bad, then God will have to deal with you about that. Now this message I'm bringing today, I'm saying this for the benefit of the radio listening audience, is on cassette tape. It will be available if you want to write in for it. 
And I brought this message today as being led of God to do so. God laid it upon my heart. I make no apology for it. The old sin of the spirit. We talk about the sins of the flesh. We talk about going out here, the ungodly moving picture show. We talk about going to the places of the world, the dance halls and places like that, which Christians should not go. That's the sin of the flesh, all right. But we don't hear many people talk about the sins of the spirit. And the sins of the spirit many times can be more deleterious than the sins of the flesh. you got to be careful about your spirit, about your attitude. Because you let the devil capture your spirit and cause you to sin in the spirit and do far more damage than you could maybe in the flesh. Guide yourself, guard yourself about your attitude, the sins of the spirit, and be careful the devil don't trap you there. If he can get your eyes all together on the sins of the world and the flesh out here, and uh, you forget about the sins of the spirit, then the devil's going to knock a home run, and you'll commit sin after sin after sin after sin in your spirit and won't realize it. Now look at my text, and I bring my message to a close. My text says over here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting wholeness in the fear of God. Not only of the flesh, but of the spirit. Sins of the spirit. That's something we need to be deeply concerned about. That's why I brought the message today, that we all might be helped, every one of us, including this preacher, about the sins of of the Spirit. Thank you. You've listened well. Everyone stand to his feet, please. Our fathers, we come today. I pray that you'll take the message and use it. Dear Lord God, we know and realize we can very easily commit sins of the Spirit. That's detrimental. That's harmful many times, far more than the sins of the flesh. We pray, dear God, today you'll help us to be saved from the sins of the Spirit. Dear Lord, have you in this invitation? Use this message, Father, on the vast radio listening audience. Speak to hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Debbie's going to play for us. And while she's playing, if God has spoken to you, the Spirit of God moves on you to come to this altar, then you come. If you've committed sin and you want to ask God to forgive you, God's a loving Father. He'll forgive you. God forgive you of any sin that you have committed if you want forgiveness. Got a mean business. Mean business, ask God for forgiveness. God forgive you. We have all made mistakes. We've all sinned against God. That's none good, no, not one. There's a time when God speaks to your heart about something maybe you've done wrong. That's a time for the Christian to go to 1 John 1 9. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Great promise for the child of God. If you'd like to come forward for salvation, rededication, or to join the church, you may come.